biggest critical infrastructures we have nowadays is power generation. If there's no power, we're pretty much screwed. Our next speakers will take a very close look at common industrial control systems used in power turbines and their shortcomings. So please give a warm round of applause to Reptep, Moradek, and Kors. Good morning, Congress. Thank you for waking up uh, in the morning. Uh, we will talk about the security of uh, power plants today, uh, specifically about uh, automation systems that are used in the power plants. Uh, you might uh, think that uh, this is another talk about how insecure the whole industrial things around us are, and uh, more or less uh, it is. So uh, for, <laughs> for years we are, uh, we and our colleagues speak about problems in industrial security. We are happy to say that uh, things are getting better, but uh, it's just that the temper is a little bit different and feels a little bit uncomfortable. So anyway, we will speak about uh, like how power plants are built, what is the automation inside, what are the vulnerabilities, and like the high-level overview of uh, what you can do with this. But uh, at first, uh, a little bit of introduction. Uh, we are uh, security uh, consultants. We work with uh, a lot of uh, industrial things like PLCs, RTUs, SCADAs, DCSs, whatever it is. Uh, we were doing this for too long. Uh, uh, we uh, actually for, for so long that we have a huge map of contacts with a lot of system integrators and vendors. And uh, throughout the time, we are not just doing the consultancy work for some uh, asset owner, for example, for a power plant, we also talk to other entities and we try to fix things uh, all together. Uh, we work at Kaspersky and actually the whole uh, research was done not just by me, Rado and Alexander who are here, but uh, also with the help of uh, Evgenia and uh, two Sergeys. Things... <laughs> yep. So things that are uh, very important to note uh, is that everything that we will discuss right now is uh, uh, reported uh, to a respective vendor, uh, basically a long time ago. Uh, you can see like uh, uh, vendors here, but uh, more or less we will speak only about one vendor today. It's, uh, it's, it is Siemens. But uh, we would like you to uh, understand that uh, similar security issues can be found in all other uh, industrial solutions from other vendors. You would uh, find uh, some of the findings not, for example, that stellar, and it doesn't require like weeks of work to find them out. And this would be true specifically for all other vendors which are not mentioned uh, in the talk. Uh, Jokes aside, we will share security uh, issues of uh, real power plants out there. And uh, it might look like we are, do we are kind of irresponsible guys. But uh, in fact, this is uh, the other way around. I mean that uh, to do some kind of research on, uh, uh, with these systems that are working in the power plants, you need to uh, get access to them, you need time to do this research, you need to have some knowledge to do this research. And uh, all these resources, they are limited for guys like us, for penetration testers, for auditors, for power plant operators and engineers. But uh, for the bad guys, like the potential attackers or adversaries, this is the, actually their uh, job. They, uh, they have a lot of investments to do some research. So we assume that bad guys already know this, and we just we would like to share some information with the good guys so they would be able to act upon this. So uh, let's go to the talk itself. Uh, power plants. Power plants is uh, like the most common way how uh, humans get their power, their electricity. They're Every, everywhere around us, and uh, the, I believe the closest one to Leipzig is called uh, Lippendorf Power Station. And uh, during this research, when we were preparing an introduction, we were surprised how many information about power plants you can get from the internet. It's not just, for example, a picture of, this, uh, of the same power station on the Google Maps. It is uh, uh, actually a, a very uh, 
uh, it's a, a very good scheme of uh, what you can see on the marketing materials from uh, vendors because when they sell some system that automate power plant operations, they sometimes start with building construction. And uh, on, their, uh, on their websites, you can find uh, a schematic pictures of actually which building does what and where you will find some equipment, which versions uh, of equipment are used uh, in these systems. But if you, like, if you don't have this experience, you can just Google things and uh, you will find out uh, which systems are used for automation in power plants. For example, for Lippendorf, it's uh, some system that is called Siemens SPPA T2000 and P3000, which is actually have another Siemens system inside called Siemens SPPA T3000. So it's a little bit confusing, and, and it is, and we are still confused. Uh, this is exactly the system that, would be, that we will focus today. Uh, the Siemens uh, SPPA T3000, uh, uh, and again, it could be any other uh, automation system, uh, but it just happened the way that we've seen this system more and more often than others. Uh, there is a way how you can uh, actually see all the generation sites throughout the world, thanks to the carbon monitoring uh, communities. Uh, this is not just power plants, this is also like nuclear sites, uh, wind generation, uh, so, so solar plants, etc. and etc. They are all here marked by uh, different fuel types uh, of, of, of generation. For example, there is a coil and uh, gas power plants mark, marked there. So the, the topic is uh, really huge. And uh, like what we will focus today in our talk is mostly the power plants which are work on coal and gas. This is important to mention. Uh, the heart of each power plant is actually a turbine. We don't have a picture of a turbine on the slides, but more or less, I think everybody saw it uh, on the airplane. They are very, they're very similar, uh, specifically in terms of size and uh, mostly how they work. Uh, on different uh, vendors' websites, you can actually find uh, a lot of information where those uh, turbines are used. And uh, this is, for example, the map of the turbines from Siemens. Not all turbines uh, specifically are used in power plants. So they have a lot of different applications like chemical plants, oil and gas, uh, a lot of other things. But if you correlate this information from previous slides, you would be able to identify like which systems are used by which power plant. And if you will Google more information, you can actually tell the versions and the generations of the systems that are used uh, on these power plants. This is important uh, because of the uh, vulnerabilities that we will uh, discuss uh, later on on the slide. So before we will speak about uh, what is the automation on power plants, we should uh, understand a little bit how they work. So we will go from right to left, and it's very easy. Uh, a little, a little notice throughout the talk, we will simplify a lot of things for two reasons. One of them to make it more suitable for the audience and uh, another thing, uh, uh, we don't really understand everything uh, by ourselves. So the first thing you should get is a fuel. Fuel could be, for example, a coil or coal or a gas. And uh, you will just put this inside the combustion chamber where you would put it, uh, will set it up on fire actually, and uh, it will generate a lot of pressure which will go to the turbine and because of the pressure the turbine will begin to rotate the turbine have a shaft uh, which will drive the electricity generator which is obviously will generate electricity and put it on the power grid so uh, it is important from now, now on to understand that uh, when we generate some, some electricity on the power plant, we put this, uh, uh, this power not just uh, for, for example, for this Congress center or for some city, we put it uh, in a big thing called power grid where other entities will uh, sell this uh, electricity to different customers. Uh, there is uh, also a very interesting point about like when we uh, do generate this pressure and the combustion chamber is on fire, we have a lot of excessive heat and we have two options, like one of them is to safely put it in the air with condensing towers. This is option number one. And another option is we can do some form of recuperation. For example, uh, we would uh, take this heat, we will warm water, uh, the water will produce steam and we will put this uh, steam in the 
steam turbine and uh, produce additional electricity. This is kind of an optimization uh, of, some, of some form. Uh, so what is the automation in this uh, process? The automation systems that are used on the power plants are usually called distributed control systems or DCSs. And uh, everything that I just uh, uh, that I just described actually is automated in, inside those systems. The vendor of the solution want to uh, simplify all things for the operator because we don't want like hundreds of people working on the power plant. We just want like maybe dozens of people working there, and they want to simplify the whole the whole process of like they don't care about where they get this gas or coal, uh, how much they need it. They just should be able to stop the generation process, start it, and they control one main thing, which is called how much power we should produce to the power grid. So like how many megawatts of electricity we should uh, produce. Uh, this is uh, uh, this th this describes the actually the complexity, complexity hidden inside these uh, solutions because there are a lot of small things happening inside and we will discuss it a little bit later. As I said, these uh, DCSs, they're not exclusively used on the power plants. There are a lot of other sites that would use the same solutions, the same software and hardware. Uh, the DCS is not just uh, like uh, a software that you can install. It's a set of hardware and software. There is uh, input output models, sensors, et cetera, and et cetera. As I said, sometimes they start from building construction. So like uh, uh, there is a field, please build us a power station. So it's a more uh, complex project so most, of, most of the time. There are a lot of uh, uh, vendors that are doing it. Uh, as I said, we are... Uh, focusing in this talk on the Siemens one. So just a short, uh, just a short, short description of uh, how, how simplified things are for operators of this DCS software. So uh, for example, if we would like to answer the question how we would regulate the uh, uh, output in megawatts of our power plant, we would need to control basically three things. Again, we are oversimplifying here. First of all, you would control how many, uh, this is an example for the, uh, for the gas turbine. So we would need to regulate how many gas we would put inside the combustion chamber. We would control the flame temperature and we will control the thing that uh, gets air inside the turbine. But basically three things that are controlled by simple PLCs in the whole system, and you would be able, for example, to change 100 meg megawatts to 150 megawatts based on these uh, settings. So the system itself that we are going to discuss is called Siemens SPPAT 3000, and actually, again, as all, all other uh, DCS systems uh, or from other vendors, this is a typical industrial systems, uh, system. It has all these things called PLCs, RTUs, HMIs, servers, uh, OPC traffic, etc., and etc. The only uh, thing that is uh, different specifically for Siemens SPP AT3000 is that they have uh, two main things uh, uh, called application server and automation server. That uh, this software running on this server uh, is not what you will find on other installations. Uh, despite the fact that there are a lot of, uh, uh, like uh, if you would read the uh, manuals for, for the systems from Siemens, there would be a lot of uh, different networks and highways and uh, a lot of uh, uh, things like uh, uh, Siemens would state that there is no connection between the application network and external networks. In practice and in reality, you will find uh, uh, things like a uh, uh, spe specific sensor network, like monitoring of vibration for an objects and uh, some noises inside the turbine. Uh, you will find the demilitarized zone because uh, uh, all in all, uh, like uh, all power plant operators, they won't have like on-site maintenance guys, engineers. They would try to do a remote support. They would need to install updates for operating system or the, for their like signatures for their antiviruses. They would need to push some OPC traffic, so like information about the generation process outside, either to corporate network or to some regulator, because the whole energy market is regulated, and there are different entities who would monitor how many electricity you are generating, or they basically will tell you how many electricity you should generate because uh, this is how many electricity was sold on the energy market. Uh, 
basically the whole talk will be structured like this. We will speak first about application servers, then automation server, and then uh, some summary. It all started with uh, the, the process called uh, uh, coordinated vulnerability disclosure. Uh, we notified Siemens about some issues uh, almost a year ago. And uh, like a month at the beginning of, uh, of December, uh, Siemens published uh, an advisory. Uh, it was uh, it was not an advisory just from uh, from the, with the issues just from us. A lot of other teams also contributed to it. And de December uh, this year's December doesn't mean that Siemens just released the patches. When they the the this system SPP eight three thousand is exclusively supported, so the system integrator for the system is Siemens itself. So throughout the year, after we notified them about some security issues, they started to roll out patches and uh, install updates uh, on uh, critical infrastructure they support, and hopefully we, they did it with uh, all the uh, sensitive issues. Uh, there is a, a lot of things to discuss here. We will skip because we are uh, a little bit in a hurry. Things like not all vulnerabilities are the same, and we use, for example, CVSS here to uh, to talk about like how critical the vulnerability is, but it's actually not very applicable to the industrial sites. You should understand uh, what you can do with each vulnerability, how you can impact the process, and uh, uh, we will skip this part. There's actually a, a kind of a threat model in a white paper that we will release later on, uh, that, that, like, like during January, we will hope. So, application server. Application server uh, is this uh, uh, main uh, is, a, is a main resource uh, that you would find uh, in the SPP eight three thousand network. Uh, like if if someone will remotely connect to the system, it would be, end up an application server. If someone wants to start the generation process or to change some values, it would be the application server. Uh, if there are other uh, servers that would, for example, try to communicate to the application server, they will actually start their work by downloading their software from application server and then executing it. So the first thing you might notice here is uh, there are a lot of, a lot of uh, network ports available on this, uh, uh, on this machine. And uh, actually, this is like the first point. There is a, like a huge attack surface for, uh, for the adversary to choose like, whether or not he would like to compromise some Siemens software, or it's Windows software, or it's some, another third party. Huge attack surface, starting from the fact that uh, the, uh, all of the installation of this uh, SPPA systems are kind of different. So uh, depending on the version and on the generation, you can find different uh, Windows versions uh, from, I don't know, 2003 to 2016. Uh, hopefully, they are all updated uh, right now. Uh, but uh, because uh, the, the 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 update process for such uh, uh, for such installations is uh, is a hard thing to do. I mean, you should wait for maintenance, and it should be like uh, maybe uh, once uh, in a half a year or once a year. You will always find some window where you can use some uh, remotely exploitable vulnerabilities, like uh, Eternal Blue or Blue Keep, uh, mentioned on the slide. There's tons of uh, different uh, uh, additional software like. Uh, old Cygwin that will allow you to do privilege escalation, badly configured Tomcat, and we have here these funny pie charts that uh, show how configuration of different software is aligned with uh, the best practices from CIS benchmarks. Those are, usually, uh, those are basically security configuration uh, hardening guides. The most important thing in uh, the application server is a lot of Java software, and uh, in a minute, uh, Rado will tell you about this. Surprise, surprise, the, the, one of the most notable problems uh, in the Siemens SPP-8C 3000 is actually passwords. There, there are three important ranges. Uh, the first, uh, first of them is like what all the installations before 2014 or maybe 2015. All passwords for, the, uh, for, for the, all power stations were the same, and you can easily Google them. Uh, we will also publish like the full word list uh, in, in, in the white paper. After these years, uh, Siemens started to generate the uh, unique passwords for all power plants. But uh, until uh, this year, it was 
kind of hard to change this password. So you need to be aware of how to do this. You need to know the process. You maybe need to contact, to contact your system integrator to do this. Starting up from this December, it would be much easier specifically to change passwords. So it's, uh, uh, in, the, in the past, it, if, even if uh, you, know, you, have, uh, you have these issues, you were not able to simply change all, all these things. Uh, Along with the passwords, passwords, you can find the, like the full diagrams and uh, uh, integrator documentation uh, that uh, can like show you how the system is built, how it's uh, operating, specific accounts, etc., and etc. Of course, this was not published by Siemens. Those some power plant operators who thought it would be a good idea to share this uh, information. So as I said, the most important thing of the uh, application server is a bunch of Java applications. And please welcome Rado, who will share the details about this. Hi everyone, uh, let's look how SPPI software works on application server. Operator can communicate with systems through a thin client and fat client. Uh, yeah. um, uh, a thin client acts as Java applet inside Internet Explorer browser and communicate with server through HTTPS. Uh, so it can be outside of application network and its communications can be constrained by firewall. In opposite, in case of fat client, uh, software should be installed on operator machine and client directly communicates with uh, RMI registry to find services and after that directly communicates with these RMI services. So uh, fat client should belong to application network. Uh, illustration of SPP architecture was kindly provided by uh, SPPA through the URL. Uh, not to be missed, let's divide it into spaces. In red zone, the item that uh, process requests from thin client and redirects them to RMI services. And in green zone, the RMI services, which act as network services on dynamic TCP ports. Uh, SPPA consists of Containers, each container can encapsulate inside one or more RMI services. Um, <clears throat> all type of containers are represented on illustration and all of them have uh, self-explanatory names. Before we go deep inside uh, uh, internals of SPPI, let me introduce some tools which used in this research. First of all, all JARS files inside SPPI are obfuscated with uh, commercial product, but this security measure can be easily bypassed by public available tool, the obfuscator. Uh, also, uh, sometimes it is useful to see how legit software communicates with system. It uh, helps to understand uh, architecture of system and uh, workflow of clients. Uh, in case of SPPA, RMI detector was written uh, it uh, represents uh, raw TCP streams in human readable formats. Uh, inside, it uses a um, method read object from Java SDK. It is known that this method is unsafe to insecure deserialization. So be careful not to be exploited through remote pickup. Uh, the first pillar of uh, SPPA is Apache Web Server. According to its uh, config folder, Orion software config uh, can be accessed by an authorized user. In fact, this folder contains uh, some sensitive information uh, of system, for example, files PC system configuration, data XMLs, and files inside AFC contain uh, startup options and uh, configuration of all containers, either application network or automation network. Elsa configuration of Orion web application in Tomcat also can be accessed using this vulnerability. And about Tomcat, there are three web applications registered, uh, remote diagnostic viewer, manager, and Orion. According to configurations of Tomcat at Apache web server, as uh, Orion servlets can be accessed through HTTPS and uh, in uh, the file web.xml, the list of all servlets of Orion application, and the list is really huge. 
So uh, some of uh, these servlets have attractive name for attacker. For example, browse servlet. In fact, it allows uh, an authorized user directory uh, listing directories uh, of uh, operation system. But in case of exploitation, another servlet is more attractive. File upload servlet uh, allows you allows an authorized file upload with system rights. Uh, parameters based and target may fully control the name of the file. So uh, this vulnerability can be easily transformed to remote code execution. You can override some startup scripts of SPPA or simply inject JSP shell in TopCard web application and get a remote code execution with system rights. Also, uh, there are some servlets which contains word service factory in the names. In fact, they uh, redirect HTTP requests to RMI services. Um, inside, uh, they parse parameters from HTTP request and search uh, desirable RMI service according to uh, parameter service URL and uh, further invoke call to the public method of security service and the name of the method defined in serialized object uh, in the data uh, section of HTTP request. Elsa parameters parameters of uh, these calls also defined in this object. Uh, so now uh, we have uh, situation when thin client and fat client can access RMI services. But in case of fat client, it can, uh, it can also uh, directly communicate with RMI registry. So if uh, application server missed uh, some important Java security updates, it contains uh, insecure deserialization vulnerability. And using public tool uh, Yoso Serial, we can simply ex uh, exploit it and get uh, code execution with system rights again. And the next task will be to list all available RMI services of SPPI system. At first step, we simply use class locate registry of Java SDK and get a big list of uh, services. All but one are Gmx RMI services. I assume that they uh, perform some general uh, interface for com, uh, for control and uh, manage uh, containers of SPPA. Uh, for further investigation, we only choose uh, lookup service. In fact, this uh, service looks like some collection of uh, another RMI services. Using uh, its public method list, we get uh, the name of all available services. And uh, using the name and public method lookup, we get the reference uh, of uh, RMI service. Uh, all RMI services in this step uh, implement interface service factory. So uh, according to uh, this, uh, we can assume that, and, uh, th that uh, this is again a collection of another RMI services but in fact, it doesn't have public method to get the name of the service. So we need to decompile. Uh, so we need to decompile the class uh, and uh, find uh, some factory methods which uh, create RMI service. Uh, for example, create admin script. And inside, we can find uh, the name of uh, a created service. As it can be guessed, it's uh, admin service. So using public method get service and this name, we finally get the reference to uh, next level RMI service. And in final step, we uh, get uh, the reference to RMI services, which perform real job of SPPA. Uh, but it, this RMI service also contains a lot of public methods for an authority user. So to sum up, we traverse a registry and at each level we found a lot of RMI services and the last uh, item also contains a lot of uh, public methods. So uh, 
the attack surface of SPPI system is really huge. So now, uh, when we list all available RMI services, the next question is how uh, does authentication of client requests performs on the system? Uh, to answer this question, let's look how uh, client requests to security services processed on system. First of all, clients uh, get the reference to security service using some client ID. Uh, further, uh, PC Service Factory uh, tried to get valid session uh, using this client ID uh, in session manager. If session manager will fail in his task, the exception will be thrown and client will be failed. But if it succeeds, valid session ID will return to PC Service Factory. And further, in its turn, um, instance of security service will be created in factory method, and uh, value of uh, session ID will be stored in a login ID uh, inside security service. And finally, uh, client will get the reference to security service. Further, he can call some public method of it, uh, but uh, these methods can uh, perform privilege checks of user using login ID in a security manager. So, uh, to sum up, we have two security measures in this system, but uh, there is a question how uh, user client can perform login operation if he doesn't have any valid client ID. Uh, in this case, at startup of the system, uh, session manager will be added uh, an anonymous session with client ID equals zero, and uh, client will use this client ID and like, perform login operation. But attacker can also use this uh, feature and simply bypass first log. So to sum up, there is only one security measure on the system, and and it fully delegated to uh, to method of remote services. But amount of RMI services is huge, amount of public methods is really huge, and so it become really difficult to manage security service of system uh, according to this uh, information. So uh, we know uh, we know all inputs of system. We know all possible security measures of system. So it's time to find vulnerabilities. Uh, uh, in the list of RMI services, there is one uh, which looks some attractive. It's admin service. It can be accessed with anonymous session. Inside, it has public method run script. This method doesn't perform any privilege checks, so we can call it without any credentials and so on. Um, at first step, this method creates instance of class loader using bytes from arguments. And um, in fact, this step will allow arbitrary Java class. This class should implement interface admin script and define method execute. And this method execute will be called by uh, run script of RMI services. Uh, for this case, we create Java class that simply run OS common from arguments uh, of run script. And we get uh, code execution on a system with system rights. Of course, there is a more powerful post exploitation of this vulnerability than simply run OS common. You can, uh, this vulnerability allows inject arbitrary Java class inside running. Uh, SPPI application. So uh, you can use some Java reflection to, uh, to patch some variables of system and, uh, and have influence of, uh, on technological properties of uh, SPPI. Uh, also, uh, privilege check inside uh, methods of RMI service can be bypassed with second vulnerability in session service. Uh, this service has public method get login sessions. In fact, this method 
return all session data of all login users on system. Uh, this information includes uh, usernames, IP, and uh, client ID. So, uh, if uh, it's this amount, uh, this client ID of user that has some admin privileges, attacker can uh, use this client ID to get uh, reference to security service, and this reference will be with some more privileged session. Further. <coughs> Further, uh, attacker can uh, call public method of uh, security service, uh, get all users, and get uh, all private information about all users of the system. And password hashes also included in this uh, private information. So, to sum up, uh, we have uh, two, uh, uh, both of these vulnerabilities can be uh, accessed uh, through uh, HTTPS and uh, firewalls. Rules can be bypassed. Uh, in general, all communication in, uh, with RMI services are unencrypted, so usernames and password hashes are transferred in plain text. This is uh, this uh, this is more uh, critical. For uh, for fat client case, uh, so uh, moreover, password hashes doesn't uh, perform any doesn't have any session uh, protection mechanism. So if attacker can perform uh, man in the middle attack against uh, some uh, user of SPPI and capture the traffic between this user and uh, application server he can get valid uh, username and uh, password hash of the system and simply reuse these credentials and uh, perform login operation on the system. Moreover, he also can uh, change the password of uh, this user. I talk a lot about usernames and password hashes, so it's time to understand how these items are organized on the system. Alex? Uh, hello, everyone. Let's continue our discussion about application server. Uh, on the previous slide, you can see how uh, remote authentication works. Uh, now, sorry, <coughs> I, I repeat. On the previous slide, uh, you could see how uh, remote authentication uh, works. On the, and now I'm going to tell you about how it's uh, organized locally. Uh, after the system, uh, after the system gets started. Uh, it begins to read uh, uh, two files, user1.xml and pdata1.exam, to get a user list and uh, their password, respectively. The, user, uh, the user's one uh, file is, uh, is a simple XML, while pdata1 has a slightly more difficult structure. It's a gzip archive encoded in base64, the right Java serialization object uh, in the gzip archive uh, containing a specific XML. Uh, the field of the XML presented on the, of the slide, uh, they are used to calculate uh, hash value and check password during the authentication. Uh, on the bottom of the slide, you can see uh, password check algorithm uh, in a pseudocode. Uh, it's a, um, uh, the cryptographic scheme is a typical for is a typical cry, uh, crypt uh, hashing scheme, uh, like in your Unix and Linux machine. Uh, it has a number of iterations. Uh, souls and the only one uh, things is ad was added is uh, uh, hard coded soul, which is the same for all users. Uh, the tool for password, uh, uh, the tool to extract uh, password hashes and their parameters uh, from the pdata1 file has been uh, developed. Uh, on the slide, you can see its output. Uh, the tool. Uh, mm, uh, the tool can be used during the password audit auditing to check uh, password, to check weak or dictionary password, uh, and their hash calculation parameters. The tool is available at the link below. Uh, draw the line, uh, uh, draw the line, and uh, application server line, uh, analysis. Uh, first, uh, have, uh, as we have seen, uh, attack surface is really huge and includes. Uh, a lot of different uh, components. Uh, 
secondly, it's about uh, remote connections. Uh, mm, uh, whether, uh, whether SPP has or has no remote connections, according, according to vendors or someone else who, uh, who told you it, uh, uh, mm, uh, you, sh uh, you should check it anyway. Uh, and uh, the last thing is uh, uh, attacker has an uh, opportunity to impact uh, power generation process. For example, it can uh, start stop generation, change some output value, or uh, gather some additional inform information about uh, generation process, uh, and all this action can be done uh, from application server. That's all about application server, and uh, let's, uh, 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 let's start discussion about automation. The main goal of the automation server is to execute real-time uh, uh, real automation functions and tasks, uh, depending on the um, uh, depending, depending on the uh, power plant project uh, architecture and uh, its features. Uh, uh, the role of the automation server can be different. Uh, we have distinguished three roles. Uh, the first one is automation role. Uh, there may be slight uh, confusion because the term is used both for server and for its role. Uh, but uh, analyzing uh, automation server configuration and uh, publicly available information, we have found that uh, whatever the role is uh, almost the same uh, hardware and software are used, and we have decided to use this kind of uh, classifications. Uh, that seems uh, less uh, confusing to, uh, to us. Uh, uh, at the same time, uh, it's slightly different from the vendor's classification. Anyway, uh, meaning uh, automation role, uh, having automation role means. Uh, uh, that the server is responsible for interaction with uh, input-output modules, which control and monitor uh, power plant equipment, such as turbine, uh, electric generator, or some, some other. The second role is communication. Uh, in this role, uh, this role is used uh, for connection uh, the third-party software and system. In other words, it's just a protocol converter supporting such protocols as uh, Modbus, IEC uh, 101, 104, and some other. Uh, and the last role is a migration role. This role is used to, uh, to connect previous version of SPPA T3000 and uh, other legacy systems, uh, such as SPPA T2000 or Teleperm ME. Automation role in uh, uh, automation role, uh, uh, automation server in automation role uh, can be run uh, on Sematic S7 PLC and uh, in uh, an industrial um, or industrial uh, uh, PC. Other role can be run only on industrial PC. Now let's talk a little more about uh, each role. And uh, let's start with uh, automation role based on PLC. Uh, PLC I will directly control field devices like uh, walls in turbine and uh, access to them. Uh, and access to them is a game over for any security discussion. Uh, they usually represent uh, the lowest level in uh, different reference models, such as Purdue model, for example. Uh, any, configuration, any configuration changes and updates uh, for PLC require to stop, uh, to stop technological process. Uh, so these devices always have security misconfiguration, firmware uh, without security updates, and uh, unsecure industrial protocols. Uh, in case of SPPA, they are uh, S7 protocols, LP, LPC data. Uh, there are a lot of information about uh, S7 protocols in the internet, but not so much about PLC data protocol. Uh, so we had to deal with it and analyze it uh, ourselves. It's, an, it's a not a special protocol for SPPA uh, when you program your SEMATIC uh, PLC and need to exchange some, di some data between uh, them in real time. You use this protocol. Uh, it's a quite a simple protocol, and maybe uh, its description uh, is available somewhere in, in the internet, but we couldn't find it, so uh, just a case, uh, show you its structure. Uh, anyway, there are no security mechanism in the, uh, this protocol, so, uh, uh, so, so only obstacle while do the main in the middle attack to spoof data in the, uh, is the sequence number, which we can uh, get from a packet and just fuzz the implementation. 
for protocol analysis, uh, we have developed a dissector, which is uh, available at the link below. Uh, during the security assessment of PLC configurations, uh, one of the main things which, uh, which we check is uh, unauthorized access to the uh, to reading and writing PLC memory. Availability of uh, unauthorized access uh, is determined by position of the mode selector uh, of the PLC and some other configuration parameters. Uh, during the previous research uh, conducted one of our colleague uh, Daniel Parnishev, uh, the privilege matrix uh, has been obtained. Uh, they show uh, unsecure states and uh, configurations of PLCs. Uh, the tool for gathering information from the PLC over the network uh, and uh, its analysis has been developed by Daniel and uh, also available in our repository. Now let's talk about application server based on industrial PC. It's just a Linux box. Uh, during the start, it uh, tries to download some additional files from the application server. Uh, this file includes uh, include, uh, jar files, bash scripts, uh, some configuration protocols files, and some other. Uh, in order to execute uh, JAR files, uh, the, PR, the PTC PR virtual machine uh, is used. It's a runtime Java machine, uh, widely spread in industrial, uh, IOT, and uh, military area. Uh, PTC contains a head of time compilation mechanism. As a, as a result, uh, JAR files contain uh, a bytecode transformation. Uh, that's why regular decompiles fails with them. To solve this problem, we have written a uh, PHP script to uh, perform uh, reverse transformation. After that, uh, regular decompiles uh, have been successful. Uh, running jars uh, open uh, RMI services on the automation server and some their extension. Uh, for example, in case of migration server, uh, the Orion RPC services, uh, which are extension of classic Java RMI services, are used. Uh, and on the slide, you can see the list of the of these services. Uh, the security issues of uh, automation server based on industrial PC present, uh, are presented on the slide. Uh, firstly, as you can see, uh, it's, uh, there is a possibility uh, to spoof downloaded files from application server. Uh, the files downloaded over HTTP and there are no security, security mechanism during the process. Uh, secondly, it's about uh, default credentials. Uh, you can uh, get access uh, over SSH, uh, SSH to server with uh, user CM admin and password CM. Uh, next, it's uh, vulnerabilities in, uh, RPC, in Orion RPC services. Uh, these vulnerabilities allow to perform sensitive data exposure and remote code execution. And finally, uh, the last group is vulnerabilities found in the software used to fill a migration role for communication with uh, SPPA T2000, also known as a TXP system. Uh, with a number of issues on migration server with uh, old TXP, you are, not, you are in magic position will be. Um, a few words about uh, Arion RPC vulnerabilities. Uh, they are in uh, runtime engineering service. Uh, this service contains uh, uh, request runtime container method, uh, where the first argument defines uh, the action to be executed. Uh, using the action read file, it's possible to get uh, content uh, of any file from the system. Using the write config file, uh, it's possible to write any information to the server. To the server, uh, uh, and uh, for example, it can be a jar files which uh, execute a shell command uh, from the command line, and using uh, some uh, SPPA um, specific functions, you can execute these jar files later. That's all about uh, automation server. Uh, to sum up, uh, automation, automation server can be based uh, on uh, PLC or industrial PC. In case of PLC, it's uh, the simple PC, it's the usual PLC uh, with, uh, with known security issues. In case of uh, industrial PC, uh, it's just a Linux box uh, which uh, try to download some additional files from the application server and some of them execute with pure virtual machine. Uh, so far, we haven't mentioned uh, any network equipment using distributed control system. Uh, using the research, we saw a wide uh, variety of network devices and network uh, infrastructure. Uh, 
including switches, firewalls, and more rare devices such as uh, data diet, for example. Uh, we try to summarize all this information and got uh, a common SPPA um, network topology scheme. Uh, we have shown in purple usual places of our network devices, but the same devices can be found in other vendors' uh, distributed control system. Uh, network devices uh, in industrial network usually have a lot of security issues. Uh, the reason for this uh, uh, is that the most of them don't require any configuration before start and can be run uh, out of the box. Uh, and uh, that's why uh, uh, the things like uh, guestable SNMP community string, uh, weak credentials for different services, uh, firmware with uh, publicly, publicly available, available exploits, uh, and uh, just a lack of security configurations. Uh, all these all these things are usual for uh, uh, are usual for network devices, and uh, uh, they are usual uh, usual security issues for in, for industrial network. Uh, I think that's all. Uh, now now Gleb uh, to uh, sum up our discussion. Yep. Thank you. So uh, the topic of power plants is huge, the system is huge, and we try to uh, cover this and that, a lot of small things in the talk, and it, like everything can be summed up on this slide. This, those are just uh, the vulnerabilities, uh, as you can see, in, like problems in Java, in web applications, in different simple m mechanisms that you can exploit to actually directly even not go into the PLCs or field, layer, uh, field level, you can impact the process itself. Uh, what we don't cover in this talk is uh, actually what uh, like havoc or disaster could be caused by attacking such systems because uh, it's actually not that bad. I mean, the, uh, if we are talking about things like blackouts of the cities or things like this, this is not what you can do with uh, attack on such system because uh, the like the distribution of the pow power in the grid is not the according to the threat model is not the problem of the power generation there should be like another regulator who should watch for like enough capacity in the network to uh, to fill this uh, to fill the electricity to the customers so what we are really speaking here is uh, uh, like the uh, is how we can uh, impact the for example the turbine uh, the turbine is, uh, itself for example uh, but we, we had no access to the real turbine, they're big, expensive, and we haven't found anyone willing uh, to provide us one, so we would destroy it. But uh, uh, the point is we have an educated guess, like PLCs, they control a lot of uh, parameters of this turbine, and the turbine is like a big mechanical monster that is actually self-degrading by working and putting it uh, into different, like, uh, uh, uncomfortable operating modes will degrade it even faster or it, it will break it and uh, it's not easy you can have a spare PLC or some other device you won't have a spare turbine uh, so the the impact is there but it's not like uh, very huge uh, so what we try to do with uh, this research mostly is uh, like to understand how we can uh, help the power plant oper operators out there and we uh, after finding all the issues and analyzing like these uh, infrastructures on the customer sites, we understood that all of the installations are actually the same, and we can write a very simple uh, do-it-yourself assessment, uh, and hopefully even like engineers on the power plants can uh, uh, test themselves. It is very easy, like set of steps on two or three pages. You connect to uh, application network, you connect to the automation network, you run the tests, you get the results, and afterwards you talk with Siemens or you can fix something by yourselves and uh, basically you don't have to hire like expensive consultants uh, to do the job you can you should be you should be able to do it by yourself we hope that you will be able to do it uh, of course uh, like to summarize the whole situation uh, around DCSs uh, it is uh, if, if you have seen other industrial solutions like SCADAs uh, like substations anything actually you would uh, find a lot of similarities and uh, they, they, the whole, like, it will have the same pain points as uh, all other solutions. Uh, there is a good document from the IAC 62443 which describes how like power plant operator or asset owner should talk to the system integrator and, and in the vendor, with the vendor in terms of uh, how, what security they should require and how they should control it. We urge any power plant operator to read this uh, standard and to 
uh, require security from their vendors and system integrators because uh, nowadays it depends from vendor to vendor. Maybe vendor is more interested in the security of the plant or some regulator and uh, like nobody knows how to act. This is the document where, uh, which describes how you should talk with uh, all other entities. Uh, of course, uh, read the slides, read the white paper uh, in January, uh, call Siemens, update all systems, uh, uh, change your passwords and configurations. This is actually very easy to uh, at least to shrink the attack surface. Uh, a lot of things inside SPPA T3000 network is, are modern Windows boxes and it's kind of easy to set up some form of monitoring so you should talk to your security operations center they would be able to uh, look for some logs. Not most of the impact that we showed, like the, it was the, the impact from the Java applications. And uh, you won't be able to monitor this with like security events in Windows, but at least it's uh, still some form of uh, detection process inside your network. Uh, and again, finally, to summarize, it is not like a problem of one DCS from, from Siemens. Uh, there are the, exactly the same issues for other vendors not mentioned here. Uh, we will release a lot of things uh, today, tomorrow, and in January. Basically, like uh, the big white paper about uh, everything that we found out with the recommendations, what to do with the word lists, with the do-it-yourself security assessments, with a lot of tools. Uh, one of the tools would uh, help you to do uh, the research, and other tools would help you, for example, if you are using uh, intrusion detect detection systems like IDSS, you would be able to parse the protocols and maybe write some signatures for them. We work closely with Siemens. We want to say thank you for the Siemens product search. They did a great job in communications between us and the product team that develops the products, uh, the Siemens SPP-83000 itself. The main outlines from the vendor response is that uh, uh, if you are a power plant operator, you should hurry and uh, install a new version 8.2 SP2. Uh, there are, uh, Siemens is trying to like, educate and uh, to raise awareness uh, inside their customers that, uh, first of all, they should change passwords, that the, there are critical vulnerabilities and they should do something with it. And there is uh, uh, not all the problems are fixable by uh, Siemens themselves. There is an, uh, uh, the operator is uh, viable for some of the uh, activities to do uh, to the security by themselves. So that's actually it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Congress. Uh, if you have any questions, please welcome. Thank all of you for this excellent talk. Uh, we have a short three minutes for questions. If you have questions, please line up at the microphones in the hall. If you're using hearing aids, there is an induction loop at microphone number three. Do we have questions from the internet? Yes. Question from our signal angel, please. So we've got a question. With the vulnerabilities found, could you take over those plans from the World Wide Web yeah. without further man the middle attacks? Uh, can you please repeat? A little bit louder, please. Sorry. With the vulnerabilities found, could you take control over those plants without worldwide, um, from public internet, without further manned in the middle attacks? Uh, actually, no, this is, and, and this is some, uh, some form of the good news. Uh, uh, as those systems are exclusively supported by one system integrator, by Siemens, they are more or less uh, protected from the external access. Of course, there would be external access, but it's not that easy to, uh, to reach it. And of course, it's, we're not talking about internet. We're talking about some corporate networks or things like this. Next question, microphone three, please. Uh, yes, hello. Uh, I also have a power plant on my planet, and uh, it's kind of bad for the atmosphere, I figured. So. Uh, my question is, can you skip back to where the red button is to switch it off? And uh, I'm asking for a friend. We never thought about uh, that the, these materials can be used in this way, but uh, yeah. Specifically, if you have uh, operators or engineers friends on the power plant, uh, you can talk to them. Do we have any more questions from the internet? No questions. Any questions from the hall? 
I guess not. Well then, thank you very much for this talk and a warm round of applause.